Welcome back to today's video. Today is Sunday, October 13th, 2024, and today we're going to be talking about the 2024 presidential race. And the fact is that it is too close to call as we head into the final stretch of the 2024 campaign season. On your screen right now is an article from Bloomberg talking about how Wall Street pros who typically bet in election after election after election are avoiding this cycle in specific because the race ultimately this close to November is too close to call. And it's a story that has been told on this channel for probably the past month now. A story that has been told in the battleground states that are increasingly getting narrower and in a point where both Democrats and Republicans stand to have an equal chance of victory across the momentous and important battleground states. Now, Kamala Harris has had a lead a month ago that was larger than it is today, as exemplified by the three new polls from ABC News, CBS News, and NBC News that show a five-point shift in favor of Donald Trump on NBC News, a one-point shift, which is the better number here uh, for uh, Kamala Harris on the CBS News front. We'll talk about that in just a moment, and ABC News showing a four-point shift, but largely running in line with that of what we're seeing on the overall averages here, with Kamala Harris in the advantage point of roughly 2.5%. You take all of these in specific, you're ultimately going to find that the average here hovers to around a two-point advantage for Vice President Harris. And obviously, the leads here have narrowed since that presidential debate, which was largely seen as an unequivocal victory for the Democratic Party and Kamala Harris together. What we saw there was that Kamala Harris did in fact defeat Donald Trump in almost every single way, whether it came down to the way that she had conveyed her issues, the way she kept her composure, the way that she interacted with him, the way she attacked him. All of these different metric points showed that the American public positively responded to Kamala Harris's debate performance. And in the immediate months after, or weeks after rather, we saw that the same set of polls were released from NBC News, CBS News, and ABC News showing us that Kamala Harris had an advantage point of four points according to CBS, five points according to NBC, and six points according to NBC. Uh, sorry, ABC. But there's no real way to cut this other than the fact that these numbers are moving in the wrong direction for Kamala Harris. But ultimately, the race still is defining itself as too close to call. We found that even in moments where the Democratic campaign is up six points on ABC, four points on CBS, five points on NBC, that those things never really aligned with what the averages were saying. Don't get me wrong, they were really good signs for Kamala Harris's campaign in the past, but ultimately they aren't telling us that she's on track to lose the election because the numbers have narrowed up. They do show an increasingly closer race, something we have come to know for quite some time now when we look at our national averages and our statewide averages. We've seen Donald Trump go from being five points in the lead in every battleground state to her entrance into the race to it being a toss-up, and it has maintained itself as a toss-up. Neither candidate has explored a lead higher than three points on the 538 average in any of the battleground states since entering into the race with very limited exceptions. And since then, and over the past month of October, since the beginning, roughly 13 days ago, the Democratic and Republican campaigns have been neck and neck. And you can also see this too, not just on 538, but also on Real Clear Politics. You can also see it on the New York Times polling average, which actually shows us a really good screen here that helps us understand just how narrow this race is. Back in 2020, there were candidates on both sides in the states that both campaigns were contesting where the leads for the candidates were larger than the largest lead we see here in 2024, which is the state of Arizona giving Donald Trump a two-point advantage. There were states like Ohio where Donald Trump was in the advantage point larger than two points. There were states like Iowa where we saw the same thing ultimately. We saw in states across the country where Donald Trump and Joe Biden had maintained averages of higher than two points despite these races, you know, some of them not actually competitive, but many of them ending up to be more narrow than expected. A good example of something that can show that the polls aren't always accurate is the state of Nevada back in 2020 that said Donald Trump would win the state against Joe Biden. Ultimately, Joe Biden won the state of Nevada. And you can see it too uh, in 2016. Donald Trump was supposed to win the state of Nevada. He did not win the state of Nevada. We saw that in some of these other states, the leads for Hillary Clinton obviously were higher than what they were, and in some cases weren't leads. Same thing with Joe Biden. The polls have been all over the place, and in 2022, it really didn't call any of our fears, because what the polls did was go in the complete opposite direction, where we had two consistent elections, 2016 and 2020, where Republicans had about an average error uh, underestimation of their support. Fast forward to 2022, we we saw that Democrats were underestimated by roughly a similar amount. And so it really has thrown all of our understanding of how valid polls uh, really are for a loop, right? It's thrown us for a loop. We know the polls tell us something, but when they all tell us Harris less than one, Harris less than one, Trump less than one, Trump less than one, Harris less than one, Harris plus one, Trump plus two, this race is mind-boggling, you know, really just insanely close. 
in a way that we really did not expect maybe a month ago, what largely is in line with exactly what we deserve when it comes down to this election uh, in a funny way, but also not. Because politics is meant to be something that is, in some cases, hopefully you enjoy understanding more about the race, but the more data we get, the less we understand about it. And I think looking at these battleground states in specific, what we know, even from not just the polls, but forecasting sites like 538 that do analyze the polls on top of a number of other issues where they go down, they do th this whole statistical model, they do national polls, statewide polls, they take a look at the jobs numbers, they take a look at approval, they take a look at past election, everything, right? Everything the polls do not take into account. And what they have found is that in this election, the majority of our battleground states where candidates are set to spend nearly half a billion dollars across these seven states in particular, five out of the seven are less than a point, and six out of the seven are a point or less, and seven out of the seven are two points or less. Very different than the 2020 election forecast. And just visually, to give you an understanding of what that actually looks like, is when we're putting it onto the electoral map. And, you know, in this case, we're going to look at margins, but not worry about them too much. What we are going to find is that these battleground states are what define this election. I mean, it really is a difficult thing to see how any of these states even expand beyond where they are right now for either candidate in the final stretches of the campaign season. And that's honestly quite difficult to come into in trying to analyze a race. But that's ultimately where we are. Right. When you're taking a look at the states, uh, Florida here goes to Trump, Texas here goes to Trump. These are all of the states that on the overall average and expectation map are decided by less than a point. Take out Georgia if you include a point being in that you know bound of ranges of numbers here. You have 82 remaining electoral votes that have yet to be characterized. And in a majority of them, you're finding that the margins here are less than a point. 66 electoral votes are being determined in states where the polling averages have them by less than a point. So when you're looking at that less than a point number, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Nevada, and you see that Georgia and Arizona are right on the cusp there, it really is difficult in any circumstance to gauge and understand an election where you have such limited data that shows anything substantive besides the race being too close to call. I know you are tired, and so am I. Both sides feel very heavily that this race should not be a close and competitive one, but that is the nature of where we are in American politics. It's not like 2016. It's not like 2020. It's a lot more, if you're looking back at previous elections, not 2008, not 2004, not 2000, but the year 2012. And allow me to explain what I mean on that end. In 2012, we remember. If you were looking at elections then, I certainly was. This is the first election I really remember. Uh, I was in elementary school, aging myself a little bit, or maybe not, maybe making myself look younger, either way, aging myself. 2012 election, I remember people talking about this race. And I remember from the perspective of someone who lived in, you know, the outskirts uh, of the Washington, D.C. metro area, the heavy levels of discussion that were being had. I grew up in elementary school watching the news, talking about these things with my family. That's what largely oriented me to where I am today. I did a fourth grade project on the 2012 election, right? So all of this stuff that really informed my opinion back then is very limited. It wasn't anything substantive. What I do remember is that the race was close. One thing I do remember is that nobody genuinely knew who was going to win. And based on the numbers here, I can honestly see why. It's a lot of what we've known to be standard in democratic politics. You've seen it even in 2016 when Hillary Clinton lost. You can find it to be true. Whether it's October surprise, James Comey, whatever it might be, it still happens. This trend line exists. Also in 2020, Biden had a much more steady advantage over Trump, but it was larger around this point. What I want you to look at is that month of September. From September 1st through the end of September, what you will find is something very interesting happening on the democratic side of politics. September is the month that Democrats come home, where Democrats consolidate their base. They win over independence, and they shift the public in viewing them in a more positive light. That's just what happens in politics here. So from the beginning of September, Obama went from leading Mitt Romney by 0.1% nationally to leading by roughly 1.4%, not even 1.4%, that's October, by four points nationally nationwide. In around a month, Obama had this surge. And if you look back at the press, you look back at the mainstream media, you look back at the coverage, all of it was positive for Obama. He's doing well, just came out of a convention, just came out of all this surging, doing well. Uh, first presidential debate that ended up not, or not first presidential debate, all these presidential events that were happening that benefited Obama. He actually did not do well at the eventual first presidential debate. But ultimately, here still, Obama took a 0.1% advantage and made it four points. Now, Kamala Harris never got to that four-point lead nationally, but she was higher in the month of September. You can see that that lead pretty much maintained itself, and at some point towards the end was on the last day of September, she led by roughly three points nationwide. 
But in the battleground states, we saw improvements. We saw improvements in Pennsylvania. We saw improvements in Wisconsin and Michigan. She led in five out of the seven battleground states on average throughout the entire month of September. Now it's narrowed down to a bit four, right? And so what we will see too, take out September, to go ahead and take a look at the month of October. It's a very, very different story. We take October into effect, and then you go through the month of October from October 1st. Barack Obama maintained a four-point lead over Mitt Romney. It narrowed down and narrowed down, and then Romney led. From October 9th onward, Romney was in the advantage. 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 Obama took it back for two days. Romney, 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 Romney. Then the final stretch of the campaign, right, on October 31st, what was it? A tie. A tie. And then by election day, Barack Obama had a sudden, quote-unquote, surge, but an advantage of less than a point over Mitt Romney nationwide. Do you remember the results? Barack Obama won by 3.9%. Now, I'm not here to say that this is an exact example of what we might see in 2024. But it's really, really close. What we saw in the month of September was that consolidation of Democratic support, largely influenced by that first presidential debate. But now we're hitting October. We're hitting the month in which Republicans bring their candidates home. And what we will find, too, is that the averages here, a two-point lead, a three-point lead, a tie, is still in line with what we're seeing on the national average. It might shift it narrowly downward because of that tie number from NBC News, but it's still very much what we have come to expect and know about the presidential races and what we have known. Even if we were to go back in month of September, we would know that six-point lead was not along the average. That five-point lead was not along the average. The four-point lead was not along the average. And so when we look at those numbers and we look back to October, or I guess ahead to October, we see that the lead really doesn't change that much. 538 hasn't thrown it in the average here. I think what we're going to see is a slight reduction. But keep in mind some of these national numbers are being, you know, influenced by numbers that show Kamala Harris with a one-point lead nationwide, Pew Research Center, right? A three-point lead. You're seeing here one-point leads, right? Two-point leads, one-point leads. Sure, some good numbers, but you're always going to have that. And these might not be the best set of numbers for Kamala Harris, but they don't defy what the averages have been telling us, and that number that has been informing forecasts like these and election forecasts like my own that results in maps like this with these 66 electoral votes really in the true and total toss-up area. And again, back to that point of 2012. This was an election that was supposed to be much closer than it actually was. Things happen on election day that people don't gauge. Obama might have had a phenomenal election in 2008, which granted gave him room to fall. But at the same time, in 2012, what the polls largely were missing were those swaths of minority voters that felt inspired in this election similar to that of 2008. Newly registered young voters that wanted to vote against Mitt Romney. Younger voters that were out there who were never polled, could not have been, were not on this group that had been pulled and stripped from Secretary of State websites or from Democratic and Republican firms that have voter databases. These are not things that existed for the polls to capture in. And what we missed in the entirety of this all was that Barack Obama was on track for his substantive victory, and he won with 332 electoral votes. Now, I don't think Kamala Harris is going to come that close. I still think this election truly is too close to call, but largely driven by the data points and data points that we see that show Kamala Harris in that competitive position. And in these battleground states, too, we could be in for two different scenarios. A 2020s type of error where Donald Trump outperforms all of these data points with limited exceptions, Nevada being that exception, where he wins all of the battleground states and loses Nevada, similar to that of the 2016 electoral map. We could also be looking at it from the lens of the 2022 midterms, the most recent cycle with polls done by the same pollsters that are polling this cycle, where we saw that in all of these battleground states, nearly with any exceptions, right? Even, no, I don't even think there's a single one where you could even draw the exception here. Every single state in 2022 that's considered a toss-up now shifted towards the Democrats based on the actual results versus what the polls had predicted. Every single one of them underestimated Democratic support. So it's a question of what type of election are we looking at? What type of election is this race going to be? Is it going to overestimate Republican support? Is it going to overestimate Democratic support? Or is it actually this close? Regardless, it's too close to call. It may not actually be too close in actuality. This race is going to come down to the wire. You've known this. It's news in its own right. It sucks to say, but it's the reality of where we are in the American political system. And it's one that informs our understanding of how to predict these races, how to look at them, how to work alongside them, how to just see how candidates interact in different circumstances with rallies, with speeches, with debates, uh, with ads, all of these different things. The point being, this race is far, far, far too close to call. And at this point in time, despite I will be making an election prediction in just a few days, 
updating you on my map from a week ago, updating you on a map from two weeks ago, on the map from a month and a half ago, because things do change overnight in the months of October and November in a presidential election. And in this circumstance, while they may not have rapidly changed too heavily, the race is still ultimately too close to call, but I do think there's some merit in predicting it. But I will say, when we look at these numbers and we get new data points, there's nothing that changes my opinion that I held a week ago, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, about how competitive this race will be. All we know is that it's full steam ahead for both candidates, and we'll see how they adjust and act accordingly, because every single moment will matter, regardless of who wins. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already, and check out the Instagram and Twitter. At the top left of the screen, there's also a Discord server if you go ahead and join. On the screen, there's a video you can watch, and then a playlist for my 2024 presidential election analysis videos. Again, thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you all later today.